Okay, this is the first of undoubtedly several lectures that I'm going to try to make on John Henry Newman. We're going to spend a few weeks reading large portions, at least half, I think, ultimately, of an essay in aid of a grammar of ascent, which is one of Newman's most important works, uh, perhaps not his most popular, but arguably one of his most important, if not the most important. Uh, it's a contribution recognized by philosophers and theologians alike, and uh, we'll say more about that when the time comes. This first lecture is going to be more biographical, just saying something about who Newman is or was and uh, what in particular about his life and thought we're going to focus on. My presentation of his biography is largely based off of the biography by Louis Bouillet. It's called Newman, His Life and Spirituality. We'll have an excerpt or two from that on our way. Uh, also on this little book by Avery Dulles on John Henry Newman there. And then I have not consulted much, but it is on my large uh, list of books to read. The definitive or most authoritative uh, biography of Newman by a guy named Ian Kerr. That's Ian K-E-R. I'm seeing now that anything I show to you here is mirrored, so you can't really read the titles. But anyway, that is a fat book that you can see, uh, mirrored or not. It's almost 800 pages. And so Ian Kerr is an English scholar, um, and he is uh, recognized as, as the leading authority on Newman, and that's his big biography. Okay, so why study Newman in a course like ours um, on fundamental theology or apologetics? Avery Dulles has some of the highest praise for him that I think helps to justify focusing on him. Dulles says that the leading Catholic apologist of the 19th century and one of the greatest of all time was John Henry Newman. So Dulles, uh, not an insignificant thinker in his own right, looks to Newman as one of the greatest apologists of all time and the greatest in the 19th century. He's also probably the best English-speaking theologian, period. So most of the theology that we know and love through UD or as Catholics is authored by people who spoke Latin or Greek or French or German. Uh, and English-speaking theologians, oh, not too many that we actually read. And uh, Newman is, is uh, I think, undoubtedly our biggest light in that regard. Um, he's a convert in multiple senses. And so as an apologist, he's sensitive to a lot of different things. Uh, he starts out his life very young, being converted to Christianity in a real sense, an evangelical Protestant kind of Christianity. And uh, he was converting from a skepticism along the lines of David Hume. So a kind of agnosticism or atheism, perhaps, uh, but in any case, not a personal religion like Christianity. And uh, so that was conversion number one. And in this conversion, he was uh, also drawing toward a dogmatic or a doctrinal form of Christianity, not a Christianity of mere sentiment. So even here in his becoming Christian, there is an apologetic distinction to be made between the kind of Christianity in the 19th century, which was largely, largely rooted in um, feeling. Uh, religion is something of emotion. Uh, this is the, the likes of, of Friedrich Schleiermacher and what came to be known as liberal Protestantism, a kind of Protestantism that leaves behind hard dogma, hard doctrine, and focuses more on the, the feeling or, or, or the sensibility of Christianity. Not unfamiliar in our own day, it's arguably uh, that is also a very popular form of Christianity, one that doesn't get hung up on the doctrines, but on the feelings that those doctrines are supposed to communicate. Uh, but then he, of course, uh, converted uh, from a kind of evangelical Protestantism to a more high church Anglicanism. So that was a, a, another major conversion in his life. And so he became sensitive to the arguments in favor of a kind of Christianity that harkened back to the greater Catholic tradition, which is what high church Anglicanism and the Oxford movement of his time sought to do. So they didn't want to follow Luther and the evangelical kind of Christianity, which repudiated a lot of the classically Christian uh, ideas like sacraments, for example. Uh, 
so at this stage in Newman's conversion, he didn't want any more to do with uh, evangelical thought. He wanted the high church Anglican thought, which tried to recover the classically Catholic elements like sacraments and dogma and things like that. But then, of course, he made another conversion uh, to Roman Catholicism, where he recognized that the high church Anglican idea of being Catholic with a, without being Catholic, so being Catholic in a historical sense or trying to appropriate what we want out of that history uh, was no longer satisfying to him. And so he came up with arguments against this high church Anglican kind of Catholicism for the particularly Roman Catholicism. And uh, so those are at least three major conversions, you know, from atheist to a kind of Christianity, from a Christianity to a kind of high church Anglican Christianity, and then finally to a Roman Catholicism. Uh, Newman also has very significant ideas on the development of doctrine, and that's largely how he came to become a Roman Catholic. And uh, these arguments and these ideas on the development of doctrine have a lot of uh, purchase today on uh, apologetic efforts to account for the ways in which Catholic doctrine is credible despite having developed significantly in its articulation. So C Catholics say that we believe the same stuff we've always believed, that in fact we have the faith of the apostles. But we have lots of doctrines that use a language that came centuries after the New Testament. And accounting for that is one of the most important apologetic efforts that Catholics can make. You know, why the language of the Council of Nicaea is a valid articulation of New Testament faith in the Trinity. Or why the medieval doctrine of transubstantiation, a word you don't find in the New Testament, is nonetheless a faithful articulation of that doctrine. Or why the 19th century definition of papal infallibility is a faithful articulation of the ecclesiology of the New Testament and the early church. So as a, as a set of principles, uh, the development of doctrine is immensely important in the apologetic effort. Uh, similarly, Newman has fantastic ideas on justification. So one of the central sticking points between Protestants and Catholics he has a whole work on the lectures on justification, which deal with that particular apologetic concern. Uh, he has lots to say about faith and reason, and that's really what our chief focus is going to be, uh, since we tend more towards the fundamental theology uh, than the, you know, strictly speaking, apologetics in this class. And uh, there he's got a lot of works to offer, the, particularly his university sermons uh, that have to do with the nature of faith and reason and the role of theology at the university. Of course, also his very famous work, The Idea of the University, and then finally, the work that we're going to be focusing on, an essay in aid of a grammar of assent. Uh, Dulles says that his most enduring contributions uh, were in the realm of what we today call fundamental theology. And Dulles points to the three works that I just mentioned in order to um, you know, give witness to that fact, namely the university sermons, also called the Oxford sermons, um, to distinguish them from sermons he offered uh, as, a, as a preacher in a parish. And uh, so his university sermons, or Oxford sermons, and his essay, Native Development of, uh, of Doctrine, um, and Grammar of Ascent, oh, and excuse me, of course, the one I mentioned that for some reason uh, Dulles doesn't mention here, uh, his idea of a university. Uh, <clears throat> okay, we're going to focus on uh, Newman's epistemology, or his theory of knowledge, how it is that we can come to know things about God in particular, and why that knowledge of God is not inferior uh, in terms of its um, credibility than uh, knowledge we might have from something like science. Uh, Newman is trying to justify religious knowledge in an age that is totally captured by the apparent certainties of science, or the deductive logic that belongs to science with its clear and distinct ideas, a la Descartes, and its positive method, a la Comte, which seems to create these ever-expanding systems where everything just follows ineluctably from the prior premise. And that kind of certainty uh, and clarity is the, is the epistemological idol of this age, 
that Newman comes out to slay in order to uh, articulate a more authentic and human epistemology and one that is capable of knowing uh, things beyond our conceptual idols, uh, namely God. So um, that is, in a nutshell, um, kind of what we're going to focus on, that epistemology. I think that you'll find as we go along that it bears a lot of similarities to the epistemological concerns of folks like Ratzinger and Polanyi. When we start talking about the illative sense, uh, you know, or the informal reasoning that uh, Newman leans on in order to uh, make statements about um, religious truths, we'll f or, or for that matter, a whole host of other things, we'll find that he bears a lot of similarity to what Polanyi calls the tacit dimension or the personal coefficient of knowledge. These aspects of our knowing that cannot be reduced to a process of rules or formal reasoning. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> some biographical notes about Newman. So Bouillet, very famous resourcement theologian, uh, Balthazar, Ratzinger, De Lubac, a guy named Schwara, uh, huge, huge theologians in the 20th century, uh, all cite Newman as very influential for them. Uh, Newman has also uh, been called the greatest Catholic theologian since Thomas Aquinas. And I'll say something, I think, at the end of this lecture about, uh, about that or maybe it's the next lecture, I forget where I have that in my notes. Um, in any event, Paul VI called Vatican II, he said that Vatican II could be called in a special way, quote, Newman's hour, given the importance that Newman had on the theologians and, uh, behind Vatican II. Newman had a lot to say that came into Vatican II, particularly on the idea of conscience, and we'll spend time talking about conscience and its relation to religious epistemology or the way in which conscience and sort is the locus within which we know God in a, in a real way. Um, the importance of dogma uh, for Newman, uh, that was something that uh, came up at Vatican II. Uh, Newman and his effort to return to the sources. So that was a big deal in 20th century resource small, return to the sources, something about which I spoke at the beginning of the, the course. However, Newman was at that long before uh, guys like De Lubac, Rahner, and Bouillet and others. In fact, they are largely inspired by figures like Newman and the Oxford movement uh, within which Newman made that initial return to the sources. So if Vatican II was all about that, Newman was all about it much earlier, and he inspired a lot of the guys who led the charge of Vatican II. Newman is also very uh, famous for, this, uh, for his contribution to the idea of the sensus fidelium, or the sense of the faithful, as a locus of, of teaching uh, authority or, 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 or the, the identification of authoritative teaching um, in the Catholic tradition. Um, he wrote a work called On Consulting the Faithful in Matters of Doctrine that was very influential in this idea as it was being molded at Vatican II. Of course, the development of doctrine, as I've already said, a, a very important idea in uh, De Verbum and uh, therefore Vatican II. And then just in general, Newman's ambition to encounter the modern world and to bring the Christian tradition, specifically the Catholic tradition, in dialogue with the modern world. Newman read the philosophers of his age, he knew his history really well, he read the classics, and he had a living mind that was able to uh, bring the church, its theology, into dialogue with the modern world, which was one of the central ambitions of Vatican II. So, um, uh, in that, those respects and so many others, he was, he was a, a, a giant influence. But he began uh, as a humble man, a uh, humble little boy, baby, in 1801, born in London. And like I said, in his, in his very early years, so by 15, he had a conversion to a, a personal doctrinal Christianity. Uh, at age 16, he goes to Oxford uh, as an undergraduate. And after great labor and disappointment, he graduates without honors. Uh, from, uh, from Trinity College at Oxford. That's kind of a sweet story in his biography. Um, you know, he was very anxious about his exams and wanting to do really well. And uh, he, he, he just had a little bit of a, of a, of a 
a brain fart, <laughs> I guess you could say, at his exams. And so he's very human. And, um, you know, this could also be indicative of his personality, maybe a little bit of an anxious or obsessive type, uh, melancholic maybe. Um, okay, so after graduating, however, people know he's, he's, he's really awesome. And so even though he didn't get honors, he applied for a fellowship and he won it at Oriel, where he worked as a tutor for, for many years. Um, as a tutor at Oriel, he came into contact with a lot of friends that eventually immersed him into uh, the, the, the kind of thought that would lead him from his evangelical ways to a more high church Anglican way. And he became um, more uh, impressed with, uh, with three principles uh, that he learned from his friends that led to his conversion away from the evangelical ideal uh, to the Anglican ideal. Uh, these three principles are identified by Bouillet, and then I think that's where Robert Barron gets them from in, in his, um, in his really good episode on Newman in the Pivotal Players series. So those three principles which underlay the Oxford movement uh, or the movement of high church Anglicanism at this time championed by Newman and his friends uh, are the following. One, the principle of dogma. So this idea that the genuine Christian tradition is not one simply of feeling, it is uh, eminently concerned with the truth of things. And so it's an intellectual religion, it is a philosophical religion, it is not content just to parrot uh, phrases and is not content just to have nice feelings. It is a, a, an ambition to know the truth and therefore a philosophical mind that attempts to engage with all other uh, modes of truth. Another important principle uh, for Newman and the Oxford movement, uh, which he again learned as he left this evangelical Christianity and adopted a more Catholicizing uh, Christianity, was the principle of a visible church, namely that the, the, the visible world is but a reflection of the invisible world and spiritual realities, that there is a, um, a, a, there is a real connection between uh, the spiritual and the physical, and it's not uh, it's not a genuine Christianity that just punts all of Christian realities to the mind or to a disembodied spirit. But the church is a reality here, moving in the world, and it needs to be engaged as such. Uh, this is obviously a principle that underlies the sacraments and also the ecclesiology of the high church Anglicans. That, uh, that Newman embraced at this time. Uh, one of the things that Newman and his friends were particularly concerned about and one of the animating principles behind the Oxford movement was in fact the tendency in 19th century England to diminish the role of the church and to essentially make it one bureaucratic arm of the state rather than allowing it its independent authority as a church a genuine spiritual reality embodied in our age. Newman and his friends didn't uh, like that trend in English culture, and so they reacted strongly against it. And the principle upon which they did that was this conviction of theirs that uh, the, the, the physical and the spiritual are, are bound together, and there is a visible church, and it needs to be uh, listened to. It's not something that serves under the state. And then finally, the third principle of this Oxford movement that Newman espoused that led him away from his evangelical Christianity to his high church uh, Anglican Christianity was the anti-Roman principle. So he said, yeah, we're going to recover all these Catholic ideas from the past, uh, you know, as we immerse ourselves in the church fathers and learn from them about the importance of doctrine and dogma and learn from them the reality of the visible church. However, we're not going to become Catholic. Uh, there is uh, a very strong conviction on the part of Newman and his friends that um, whatever happened between the ancient church and the medieval church was something uh, bad, unhealthy, more particularly the modern church of the papacy. Um, there, I, I make that qualification because some of Newman's friends did have at least a romantic respect for the Middle, Age, Middle Ages. Um, but for sure, all that we, they saw in the, the quote-unquote modern Catholic Church uh, 
uh, and its corruption. So it's idolatry of Mary and the saints. It's infatuation with the Pope. These are things that they would have argued uh, are not part of the Catholic tradition. And therefore, these are things that we reject. So while we want to embrace the Catholic, we're, 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 we're not embracing the Roman. So uh, principle of dogma, the sacramental or visible church, and the anti-Roman church. Uh, this uh, is described by Newman and others in the Oxford movement as their attempt to chart out a middle way between the evangelical Protestant and the Roman Catholic. Uh, they uh, wanted the doctrine and the sacramentality that the evangelical or the Protestant didn't give them, but they didn't want the, the corruptions and the strangeness, the Romish popery. Uh, that the Roman Catholics had. And so they said, ah, we the Anglicans, we're something of a middle way, a via media, um, between the corruptions of the Anglicans and the heresies of the Protestants. Uh, this um, this uh, chart that the via media was, was, was uh, navigating, uh, Newman uh, tried for many years, and uh, he eventually became disillusioned with it. And one of the big moments in his disillusionment was in 1841 when he published uh, a work uh, on the 39 articles. Now, the 39 articles were this, this document in England that demanded that anyone participating in civil society, holding office, um, you know, being an official pastor of the English church, um, also even being a student uh, at, the, at the universities run by the state, required you to sign to 39 articles um, that established the, the Anglican Church. And Newman gave a reading of these Anglican articles that essentially opened them up to being signed by a Catholic. He, he said that there's nothing in these that's intrinsically anti-Catholic. And that launched a firestorm because Newman uh, was essentially saying that the authentic church, the authentic faith of the English church is one amenable to Catholic principles. And uh, that, that, uh, that launched a major reaction by the Anglican bishops and, um, and the civil world. And they essentially told Newman to, to shut his mouth and that this is totally wrong. And so this, this humbled Newman and this set him thinking. And uh, he began to discover that he, he was not quite at home in the Anglican Church as he might have liked to think. Uh, it began a long process of reflection. Eventually, he distanced himself from the Anglican Church insofar as he could no longer serve as a priest. Uh, he didn't formally convert to Catholicism, but he, felt he was so confused at this time that he could no longer uh, be one of its ministers. Uh, he retreats to Littlemore, um, a little place uh, where he can kind of be alone and write. And he reads and researches uh, the work that eventually does take him sort of over the hill to become Catholic, an essay on the development of doctrine. And it's in 1845 that he becomes Catholic. And uh, I will leave an exploration of that work uh, to you if you want to for your paper. We just don't have um, the time right now. Uh, it's, it is a wonderful work. Um, and uh, totally merits uh, being read by uh, anybody who's interested in Catholic theology, to be sure. But our focus is just different in this course. So um, <clears throat> the last biographical notes that I'll give here uh, are of his Catholic period, where it's not at all a very rosy affair. Unfortunately, you know, we'd like to think that here's this brilliant Anglican who becomes Catholic, and he was received with open arms and all kinds of affection by the Catholic Church. Unfortunately, that just wasn't the case. So um, even the, the, the Pope was kind of, you know, happy to have him, but a little suspicious about, you know, exactly who is this former, you know, Protestant now become Catholic. I mean, you know, am I so sure I want to rubber stamp everything he says just because he converted? Uh, this, the work even that led Newman to become Catholic was misunderstood and misquoted by uh, many different um, theologians in America and Rome and elsewhere, leading Newman to feel terribly misunderstood by the people that he thought he was, you know, championing. Um, when Newman became a Catholic, he wanted to become a priest. And so in 1847, he was ordained a Catholic priest. Uh, 
For two years prior to that, he was studying Catholic theology in Rome, and he was sorely unimpressed with the state of Catholic theology. Uh, Louis Bouillet uh, says, in fact, that, quote, round about the year 1840, Catholic theology was, it must be admitted, non-existent. And that's a very harsh criticism that uh, becomes uh, intelligible when we know a little bit about the history of Catholic theology, uh, at least the way that narrative is, is uh, common, commonly uh, given. And uh, the narrative goes something like this, that uh, you had, of course, the great period of scholasticism in Aquinas and Bonaventure, and in some people's minds, Duns Scotus. Uh, but then after the 13th, 14th century, there was a decline in... Uh, creative, authentic theology. You had at best a kind of commentary tradition um, and uh, a decadent scholasticism, they say. But then after this decline in, in scholastic culture, you had the blows of the, the 18th and 19th centuries, the, the revolutions in France and or throughout Europe, which essentially destroyed the Catholic universities and monasteries, which were the centers of intellectual life in the Catholic Church. So it's no wonder in the, that in the beginning of the 19th century, after the decline of scholasticism, and after the social and political revolutions that just tore up Europe and burned books quite literally very often and tore down monasteries, yeah, okay, you didn't have a lot of great Catholic culture. You know, sorry, but the 19th century was too busy taking away Catholic universities for those Catholic professors to be continuing that culture. So uh, that is a, a, a fair charge to be admitted. And, um, you know, it has to do both with the, the sterility of the Catholic mind at this time, but also, frankly, the rabid secularism, which was pillaging Catholic libraries. Okay. Uh, but in any event, it, it just was the case that the uh, Catholic theology at this time was unimpressive and Newman recognized it. And Newman saw that uh, to his chagrin, uh, these, these uh, seminarians were just studying the manuals and the textbooks given to them by their professors. They, quote, had no philosophy nor even a care to find one. Uh, they did not go and try to read Thomas Aquinas. They did not try to go read Aristotle. They were content to have, at most, uh, their professors' um, uh, textbook quotations of these uh, authors. They, it, it, their theology was wrapped up in, uh, as Newman would say, facts. Uh, so these positive little data points, um, exegesis of scripture, and there was no philosophical effort to sort of grab all the data into an intelligible whole, into a kind of system, something that you could defend. It was just sort of the memorization of thesis statements and, um, and citations and things like that. Um, so obviously for somebody like Newman, who is intensely concerned not just to memorize data, but to know the truth, uh, somebody who had a real philosophical spirit and was you know, always trying to examine what he knew and what he didn't. Um, that was obviously untenable. Okay, I'll stop the, uh, the lecture here uh, on his biography and begin another one on um, the, the, the basic idea of his religious epistemology that we're going to try to uncover together.